Amen. I'll ask you to take your Bibles and <clears throat> turn to the last chapter of the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> you know, a brother who preaches in the church might feel a little uncomfortable preaching the same text his pastor would be preaching if I was in chapter 1 or 2. <clears throat> But by the time he reaches chapter 13, <clears throat> maybe you will have forgotten the things that I've shared tonight, and our brother will refresh you on those things. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 8. Let's stand together as we, as we read, and we will read together silently as I read aloud, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. <clears throat> Verse 14, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. You may be seated. <clears throat> My text tonight, the main text for our consideration is Verse 14, For here... Have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come? And the brethren have already prayed about the new heavens and the new earth, and about Jesus coming, and about who wins in the end, and those mansions in heaven that are being prepared. <coughs> and I've been encouraged, as you men have been praying around my message all evening. <laughs> So our main text is verse 14. It's a small verse, but it's a big truth. It's a summary of our lives as pilgrims in this world. We could even say the Christian life is summarized in this verse, as in many other verses. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. This present world is not our home. Amen. We're looking for a better world, a better home, and we're looking for a continuing city. This is a repeated theme in the book of Hebrews, as we see in Hebrews chapter 11 and <clears throat> verse 13 through 16. I'll read it very briefly. I won't comment on it now. But the scripture says, these all died in faith, Hebrews eleven thirteen. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Amen. Amen. God has prepared for his people something beyond this world. God has prepared for us a city. 
Well, let us begin our exposition with a look at the context of Hebrews 13, 14. <clears throat> the context, sometimes it's hard to say where the writer of Hebrews begins a context, but I'm going to begin in verse 8. And in verse 8, the Bible says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Our Lord is immutable. Our Lord is always the same, and he never changes. <clears throat> In verse 9, he warns them about false doctrines, diverse and strange doctrines. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. And so we can even see something of the connection between verse 8 and verse 9, because our Lord is unchanging, but men are bringing in changing doctrines. And the apostle is saying, don't be carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, which we know that, <coughs> that the... Hebrew Christians were being tempted to go back into Judaism. They were being tempted by all of the, the pomp and the beauty and the display and the familiarity of, of, the, of the religious ritual of Judaism and the beautiful temple and all of the, the beauty of the priesthood and all of the display that God had created and God had ordained, and they were tempted to go back into that. And so the writer of Hebrews is carrying out that same theme of showing them how much better is Christ, how much better is the new covenant, how much better is this city that we're looking for than this earthly Jerusalem or whatever it is that's capturing our minds. In verse 10, he says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. <clears throat> now, some say that the cross of Christ is the altar here. <clears throat> John Gill says that Jesus is the altar spoken of, that he, Christ himself, is the altar, as well as the sacrifice, and as well as the priest, who offers the sacrifice of himself. And I have to agree with John Gill as the context emphasizes Christ. The context emphasizes Jesus. In verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. In verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without or outside the gate. And so the context is looking at Christ. <clears throat> but he, he mentions an altar, and <clears throat> perhaps we have an indirect allusion here to the Lord's Supper. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. We have Christ. They have no right to eat of this sacrifice. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. So he reminds them that the sin offerings of the old covenant are burned outside the camp of Israel. In verse 12, he goes on to say, Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without or outside the gate. And then verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp or outside the camp bearing his reproach. He's exhorting the Hebrew Christians <coughs> to go out of old covenant Israel and let us go forth unto him outside the camp bearing his reproach. He who, who died on the cross of Calvary outside the city, let us go forth unto him, bearing his reproach. For here 
have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And so in verse 14, our text, he gives a supportive reason for going outside the camp unto Jesus. And that supportive reason is that we have here no continuing city in this world. This world is not our home. This is not an abiding city. This is not an abiding place. We have here no continuing city in this world. Number two, we are seeking a city which is yet to come. We are seeking a home. We are seeking a city which is yet to come. So let us go outside the gate unto Jesus, outside the camp, speaking to those Hebrew Jews, (coughs) because here we have no, because Jesus did, and we're going forth to him outside the camp, and here we have no continuing city in this world, and we're seeking a city which is yet to come. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews is looking at two things in verse 14. This world is not our home. This world is not where we belong. America is not our home. America is not where we belong forever. We're here temporarily, but we're moving on. He says, but we seek one to come. Well, my first point on the basis of this verse is that we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. We are strangers and pilgrims in this temporary world, and we're moving on to our permanent dwelling place, and we seek (coughs) a country yet to come. We saw that also in Hebrews chapter 11. And verse 13, which I read, where the Bible says, <coughs> of the men of faith in the Old Testament, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Peter says the same thing in First. Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, when he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Brothers and sisters, we are strangers in a strange land. I know a little bit about being a stranger in strange lands, having lived in Africa for some 16 years. My family is aware of what it is like to live as a stranger in a strange land. To be, to walk down the street and have little children uh, chanting Azungu, 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 because that is the word for European, and that's what they consider us as. Even a black American was there in Malawi working in missions, and they called him Azungu as well. So it wasn't really just the skin color, but we were strangers in in a strange land. (coughs) Came back to our home country thinking, "This, this is wonderful America. This is the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we discovered that we were also in another foreign country where we feel to some degree as though we are strangers and pilgrims even in our own country. But we are strangers and pilgrims in America. We are strangers and pilgrims in this world. Here we have no continuing city. The Israelites are the great picture for us of the Christian life being a life of wandering in the wilderness of this world. As they wandered about for 40 years in the desert, 
um, they were a picture for us of a people who were strangers and pilgrims for a long period of time going to the promised land, going to a special place, the land of promise. Well, the truth that we are strangers and pilgrims is repeated throughout the scriptures. We see it throughout the Bible. Hebrews 11 also shows us that. American Christianity does not take this truth very seriously, that we are strangers and pilgrims in the world. We're all influenced by the culture around us. Whether we like it or not, we are all influenced by the same culture. For a long time, we've lived as if America was our home. God is weaning us from that. God is weaning his people from the idea that this is our home and this is where we belong. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to appreciate good old constitutional America. I appreciate good old constitutional America. I I appreciate a country where where there is a constitution based on biblical principles. I appreciate a country where there is a a prevailing um, righteousness and and moral standard that, that perhaps came down to us from the revivals and the Reformation. But I do want to say that I believe God is weaning us from an over-preoccupation with our country, and that we need to see ourselves as strangers and pilgrims in this world. Making America great again is not, is not the great ideal. Making America great again. How are we going to make America great again? We need a revival if America's going to be great again. We need reformation. We need, we need a radical transformation. Did you know that... <coughs> There are books written about this, and you, and you can look for it if, if you so desire, that in the past 25 years, 40 million people, <laughs> I almost said Christians, 40 million people have left churches in America. In the last 25 years, a book was written about this in 2015. This is before COVID. This is not all covid This is not all of the the foolishness of the past so many years, but this is something, a trend in this country is that America is becoming more and more of a secularized state, and the God of this country is more and more the God of materialism and the God of of energy, materialistic energy, And, and this is not a Christian country nor was it really ever a Christian country, <clears throat> but there were more Christians at, at certain points in time. But this is not our home. America is not our permanent dwelling place. We're thankful for the good of this grand experiment, <clears throat> but we realize that God is not putting his blessing upon unrighteousness in this country. America is not our hope. America is not our permanent home, and we need to see ourselves as strangers and pilgrims here. That is what we are. (coughs) Well, we're strangers and pilgrims in this world. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is your treasure? Where is your treasure? <clears throat> we should not be living as if, as if our treasure was something that was in this world. Too, too many Christians are manifesting a lifestyle of materialism that indicates that their treasure is in this world. <clears throat> Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you're a stranger and a pilgrim in this world, where is your treasure? And the writer of Hebrews is pointing us 
beyond this world. And he's pointing us to that city, that continuing city, which is yet to come. <clears throat> well, if you're a stranger and pilgrim in this world, then what are you pursuing? What are you pursuing in this world if you are a stranger and a pilgrim in this world? What do strangers and pilgrims pursue? Paul said in Colossians 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Seek not those things that are here below. <laughs> seek not after material things and riches and, and, and fame and fortune, all the things that are of this world, but seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And then he said, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. He's doing the same thing that the writer of Hebrews is doing. He's taking us away from a preoccupation with this world and he's pointing us to our future hope. He's pointing us to Christ. When Christ shall appear, you shall also appear with him in glory. If you're a stranger and pilgrim in this world, where is your love? Where is your love? John said in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. <clears throat> For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. There's the idea again. The world passeth away. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. This is a pattern throughout all of Scripture. But where is your love? if you're a stranger and pilgrim in this world. So we're in the world, and the Lord left us in the world. <clears throat> he even prayed to the Father in John chapter 17, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. He so willed that we would live in this world. But here we have no continuing city, but we're here in this world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. But then later, he says, I will that they be with me where I am, Amen. that they may behold my glory. <coughs> Why do we want to behold his glory? Because he wants us to. <laughs> And because we want to, he's put that want to in our hearts. <clears throat> we are in the world, but we are not of the world. The Lord left us here for a reason. He wants us to shine for him. He left us here to shine as lights for his glory in this dark world. Amen. May we see ourselves as strangers and pilgrims in this world. Do you see yourself as a stranger and a pilgrim? In this world? Are you too familiar with this world? Is, is this, has this world captured your heart and your mind? What do you think about? Do you think only about this world? Or do you seek the one that is to come? Well, number two, as strangers and pilgrims, we should hold loosely to the things of this world. As strangers and pilgrims, we shouldn't have such a firm grasp on the things of this world, but we should hold loosely. Well, can you see that principle hiding in the text? The text tells us, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I see that, that principle, that idea hiding in there. <laughs> it's not explicit, but it's implicit. As strangers and pilgrims, we should hold loosely to the things of this world. Paul saw it in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 29 through verse 31. 
He said, But I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. <clears throat> Paul saw it. <clears throat> Paul saw the idea that we should hold loosely to the things of this world. Now, Paul is not disparaging marriage. And Paul is not telling you to ignore your wife. When he says, <laughs> when he says, that both they, they that have wives be as though they had none, he's not telling us to ignore our wives, nor is he telling the wives to ignore their husbands. <clears throat> Paul, Paul is not saying that we should never weep when he says, and they that weep as though they wept not. Paul, Paul himself wept. Jesus wept. Paul is not saying that we should not weep. But, he said, as though they wept not. Paul is not telling us that we should never rejoice, although it sounds like it. He says, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. Yes, we do rejoice, but Paul is saying as though they rejoice not. And Paul is not telling us that we should stop buying. But he says, and they that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. <coughs> And the idea here is that we are not to hold on to this world as if it was the only thing we had. But we are to hold loosely to the things of this world. And so our spouses whom we love and our things that the Lord has given us and, what, and all of these things that he's talking about, even this idea of rejoicing and even this idea of buying and having possessions, these are temporary things. These are not the things to be held on to at any cost. In essence, Paul is telling the Corinthians to not have too much focus upon this life, not to have too much <coughs> of a grasp on the things that we possess in this world, even legitimate things, even the good things that God has blessed us with, our houses and all the things that we have, they are not to be the grand central focus of our lives. We're to hold loosely to the things of this world. Well, I heard a story, <coughs> and I've never seen it happen, although I've had monkeys in my yard, in, in Africa, I've had baboons in my yard. We used to have monkeys who would run through the coiled razor wire on the top of the wall fence, and the monkeys would run at high speed through the razor wire and not get cut. And they'd come through the wire because there was a guy living on our property who would feed them bananas, and so they would come. <coughs> but I've heard that you can catch a monkey by putting food in a big, heavy bottle with a small opening in the top. The monkey reaches into the bottle and he grasps the banana or other sweet fruit and when you approach with a net to catch the monkey he won't let go and he can't take the bottle with him and he can't get the banana out but he holds on. He's grasping that banana with all of his strength and he won't let go so you catch him. <clears throat> he holds on so tightly to the prize that he forfeits his freedom. <clears throat> you know, crabs are that way as well. You can take a piece of chicken on the end of a string and cast it into the water, and the crabs will come to the chicken and hang on. You pull the string out of the water and put the net under the crab, and you've caught a crab. <clears throat> they forfeit their freedom because they want to hold on to those things. How many of us are forfeiting our freedom in Christ? Our, our facility for living for God 
because we're holding on to the things of this world. As strangers and pilgrims, we should hold loosely to the things of this world. Are you holding too tightly to the things of this life or even to physical life itself? Are you willing to go and be with the Lord? My family knew another missionary family, the Enochs, who had to leave the Congo. <coughs> they lived in Congo, D Democratic Republic of Congo. We used to call it the DRC. <coughs> because of uh, civil war and, and strife in the country, and people were being shot and killed outside their gate. They saw bodies, corpses of people laying outside their gate, and they had to leave the Congo. And so they packed a few suitcases, put them in the car, and went to Zambia, where they converted an old chicken house into a home for themselves. This was an American family living in a chicken house. It was a big chicken house, more of an industrial chicken house. But, but nevertheless, it was a chicken house. And they had curtains in the chicken house. And, and they lived there. And <coughs> it struck my wife as we were talking about this that they were holding loosely to the things of this world. They weren't holding on at any cost as, as if this world was, was the end of all things. We're told in Scripture to remember Lot's wife. You remember she turned back to look at what she lost in Sodom and Gomorrah. She turned into a pillar of salt because she grasped, grasped too tightly the things she had gained in Sodom. We don't know what she was thinking exactly in her mind, but she looked back with longing to the things that she had left behind. Number three, as strangers and pilgrims, we have a better hope in heaven. <coughs> this is where all the brethren were praying around my message. <coughs> Hebrews 13, 14, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. The word seek here means to desire or crave after something. But we desire, we crave after that city to come. Joel Beakey said that <clears throat> unlike modern Christians, the Puritans believed that you should have heaven in your eye. Quotes, in your eye. The whole time you are walking on earth. The Puritans believed that you should have heaven in your eye the whole time you're walking on earth. He said, for the most part, evangelical Christians today do not live that way. The Hebrew Christians in chapter 11, verses 13 through 16, which we already read, desired a better country. <clears throat> they died in faith. They were a people who believed God. They were looking to, by faith, to something that God had promised them. They died in faith. Not having received the promises, God had given them his promises, and they hadn't received them yet, but they were holding on by faith to those promises. But having seen them afar off, they had eyes of faith to see those promises. They saw them afar off. They saw Christ. They saw heaven. They saw the new heavens and the new earth, as it were. They saw them afar off and were persuaded of them. Are you persuaded that there is a continuing city? If you are, you'll live like it. And these these men of faith and women of faith were persuaded of them <coughs> and embraced them. They held on to the promises. They let go of the world. They held loosely to the world, and they held on to these promises. Amen. They embraced them, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They confessed it. I'm a stranger. I'm a pilgrim in the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. <laughs> They're looking for a country. How many of you are looking for another country? I'm looking for another country. I want to leave this country behind, and I want to go to God's country. I'm not saying I'm leaving America. 
for another country on earth. But they seek a country, and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And he goes on to say in verse 14 of chapter 13, but we seek one to come. We seek one to come. <clears throat> With them, let us seek the city yet to come. With them, let us earnestly seek that city yet to come. With them, let us perseveringly seek that city yet to come. With them, let us zealously seek that city which is yet to come. Peter had heaven in his eye in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. He spoke of that of, of God <coughs> begetting us again unto a lively hope. And in verse 4, he calls it, he says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved in heaven. It's kept there in heaven for you. <clears throat> Paul had heaven in his eye in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'll just look at it briefly here. Paul had heaven in his eye. Peter had it, but Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 17 said, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul had heaven in his eye. And he was exhorting the believers <coughs> to focus on heavenly things and to take their eyes off of temporal things. Well, let us just think briefly about our heavenly hope. Let's briefly look at, at what the writer of Hebrews is talking about when he says, but we seek one to come. Our heavenly hope is all wrapped up in the blessed hope of the second coming of Christ. Our heavenly hope is all about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is our blessed hope. Jesus is coming again. Amen. And that, that is, <coughs> our mind should not be on this city in which we live. Our mind should not be in this country, in this world in which we live. <coughs> we should be holding loosely to these things, but we seek one to come. And it all begins with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of your inheritance, all of the blessedness that God has for you, everything that God promises you begins with the coming of Christ. He delivers you from the wrath to come when he comes. He receives you unto himself. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The Lord is coming. Our heavenly hope begins with the coming of Christ. It, it's hard to convey it. It's hard to imagine. But he's really coming. And we will see him as he is. And, and we will see him in all of his glory, in all of his majesty. And we will behold his glory when he comes. Our heavenly hope involves brand new spiritual bodies made in the likeness of Christ. <clears throat> now we want to go to heaven 
but we want, don't want to go to heaven in these bodies. We want new bodies. We want bodies that, <coughs> that are not beset with all of these infirmities that we have. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, dis disembodied, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So the Lord is coming. That's our blessed hope. And when he comes, <coughs> we shall be changed into his likeness. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, will be changed into the image of Christ. Our heavenly hope involves a new heaven and a new earth. John in Revelation 21 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away." And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Christ is coming. We will be translated. We will be transformed. We'll have new bodies. <coughs> and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I was somewhat troubled by the thought that perhaps... Sometimes the Lord would be in heaven and I would be on earth in the new heaven and the new earth. And I, I couldn't understand, I couldn't resolve in my mind the idea that there was a heaven and an earth. Why a new earth if there's heaven? Why not just heaven? And Maurice Roberts helped me. And he hasn't given me much scripture, but he said, <coughs> it seems to me that what God is telling us in scripture is that heaven and earth will coalesce into one. Amen. I'd never heard it, but Maurice Roberts shared that with me. It will be one new beautiful house, one new perfect world, and it will be filled with beauty and glory. Heaven and earth coming together in one. I love it. That solved the problem for me. We're all together now. All of heaven comes down to earth, and we're with him forever, and it fits the promises. Well, our heavenly hope involves a new work and heavenly worship and beholding Christ in all his glory. Someone with tears in their eyes said to me one time, I don't want to go to heaven because I don't want to sit on a cloud and play a harp all the time. And I said, no, that's not the picture the Bible gives us of heaven. We'll be with God. We'll be serving him. He's entrusted us with, with, with things to do, talents now. He will reward us and give us more to do. He, you have a city now that you're taking care of. He'll give you more cities when he comes. There will be a new work and a heavenly worship and beholding Christ in all his glory. We will do similar works like angels. Because Jesus said, you will be as angel, like the angels of heaven, not marrying or giving in marriage. <clears throat> if we will be faithful in our little earthly work, he will bless us with more. We'll have a new time frame. We will then be in eternity. 
and it will be one continual day. I know there aren't very many people like this, but I've known a few people in life who didn't like to sleep. I like to sleep. But some people don't like to sleep. <coughs> I think my dad was one of those people. He didn't like to sleep very much. And when I was young, he would work a couple of jobs. He would, he would do all kinds of things, and he very rarely slept. On Saturday morning, he would sleep in, but he very rarely slept. <clears throat> we'll be in a new time frame. We'll be in eternity. It will be one never-ending day. And it will be a world of righteousness, a world of perfect righteousness, unlike the world of our day where the news is always coming across with unrighteousness, a world of perfect peace. <clears throat> and that is all reserved in heaven for you. I should have said a world of perfect love. Amen? It is a world of love to which we're going, as well as peace. Well, let me close with just one more thought, and that is, number four, as strangers and pilgrims, we have a great motivation for holy living. As strangers and pilgrims, we have a great motivation for holy living. <coughs> In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, Peter says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, <coughs> be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Prophecy in Scripture is there to motivate us as we consider the negative prophecies and the wonderful promises for believers. We are motivated to live for him. If in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable, Paul said. But our great hope makes us the most blessed of all men. As we live in this world, let us not live as if the world were our final destination. Let's not live as if this is the end of it all. Let us live with the better country in our view, and let us grow more and more in our desires for that better place. Let us have a perspective on trials that keeps the promises solidly before us, like our Lord, let this mind be in you, <coughs> and who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Let us have a stranger and pilgrim mentality, like Israel in the wilderness, and like the hall of faith people in Hebrews chapter 11. Let us not settle down and live as if America was our final destination. Our hope is not to make America great again. We want to see America turning to Jesus. We want to see righteousness in the land. But our great hope is in Christ and the glory that awaits us. And as Mr. Beakey also said, may God grant that we may say with Bunyan's Pilgrim, I am come from the city of destruction and I am going to Mount Zion. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless his word. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, as your weak servant has sought to bring across a great truth, Lord, we, we just pray that you would impress the scriptures on our mind, yes. that you would impress upon our minds that, that we are strangers and pilgrims in this world and that we would not hold tightly <coughs> to these things but that we would seek that heavenly city yet to come, that glorious Savior who is coming in the clouds to receive us unto himself. Father, give us grace that we may see these things by faith. May you enlarge our hope. May you give us grace to, to have an eye on heaven as we walk through this world. We ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.
Amen. Let us stand together for our benediction. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless Amen. you.